Right, it's uh, seven o'clock and then we can get started. So um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the latest of VetCT's 12 minute take home webinars. It's great to see so many people here once again. And just to say, um, if you haven't had a chance to try the VetCT app yet, uh, please remember that you can register for your free trial. Just download the app and create an account or you can contact me directly. Uh, you'll see my email on the screen at the moment or the team at sales at vet-ct.com and we'll be happy to help. The VetCT app will give you 24 seven access from your mobile phone to a team of friendly specialists across all disciplines. Choose to communicate with the team via instant callback, text chat, uh, book an appointment at a time that suits you or ask for a written report and you, uh, you'll learn on each case. Anyone in the UK will also get the added benefit of real-time CPD. So on to today's 12 minute webinar. As a reminder, the session itself is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end. So please do add any questions. We ask into the Q&A section that you should see um, of the webinar rather than into the chat function. We will answer as many as we can in that time and follow up with any others after. Um, so to get us started, I'd just like to introduce you to Marie, who is going to discuss how to tell if burnout is around the corner and offer up some tips on how to reduce the pressure. So it's over to you, Marie. Wonderful, David, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining us for our quick 12 minute session. So really excited to share some information with all of you today and we'll get right into it. Again, this is the burnout barometer, how to tell if burnout is around the corner and reduce the pressure. So the burnout is defined by the World Health Organization as a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And when we think of burnout, we think of it having three main characteristics. And these characteristics are typically what we use um, in scoring systems when we are assessing individuals for burnout. So the first characteristic is emotional exhaustion, which is feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion. Cynicism, which is feelings of negativity related to the job or increased mental distance from the job and then reduced professional efficacy, which is a low sense of accomplishment at work, or just feeling like even when there's successful things happening at work, that it doesn't make much of a difference or it doesn't feel like it matters. So there are many work-related causes as well as lifestyle-related causes of burnout that I'd like to share with you. When it comes to burnout at work, I think we are all experiencing this right now where our workload is excessive. Uh, workload, unfortunately for most hospitals right now is far exceeding the staffing capabilities. So feeling like there is no control over the cases or the workload or the workload just feels um, you know, unrelenting is a cause of burnout. Feeling like there is not a lot of reward or acknowledgement for the work being done. Feeling like there's unrealistic expectations at work, whether the expectations are unclear or whether they're just too demanding, you know, asking a person to do the job of two individuals because one person is sick or, you know, asking people to change their appointment schedule to, you know, from every 30 minutes to every 15 minutes. These would be causes of burnout. The opposite can be the case too for causing burnout where if a person is doing monotonous work whereby it's not challenging or they're not utilizing their skills that this could lead to burnout as well. So we, we see this a lot in veterinary nurses or veterinary technicians where they're just not, their skills are not being utilized and they can become very bored with what they're doing which can lead to burnout. Working in a very high pressure environment. So those of you who like me um, work in the emergency department, uh, you know, we, we tend to thrive a little bit on chaos, but when our days are always chaotic and unpredictable, this can lead to burnout as well. And then believe it or not, there are studies in the veterinary literature examining toxic work environments in veterinary hospitals and demonstrating an association with burnout. So if you work in an environment where communication is not effective, people talk behind each other's backs, people are walking on eggshells and not confronting situations or negative behaviors are not being accounted for, those would all be symptoms of a toxic work environment and that can also lead to burnout. 
So burnout also has some lifestyle related causes. So feeling overextended, many of us through the pandemic have had to do homeschooling or um, take care of our children. So home responsibilities, working very long hours, working multiple jobs can lead to burnout, not making time for self-care. So not getting enough sleep, not taking care of oneself, not having any separation between work and home life. So a lot of people talk about work-life balance. I prefer to talk about work-life separation. So we know that amongst medical caregiving professionals, there has to be time when we are not doing or thinking about work. Otherwise, if we never get that mental break from work, it can really build up and lead to burnout or even compassion fatigue. So Work-life separation, if you're always on call or if you're always going into work on your days off can lead to burnout. Not having enough of a social support structure or not taking time off, so not taking breaks at work, not taking vacation, all of those things can lead to burnout. And what does burnout look like? Well, people will often appear overwhelmed, they will feel like they just can't keep up with their work demands, you know, maybe your records are piling up. Um, you know, you haven't gotten to any of your callbacks from the last two weeks, losing interest or motivation with work, low energy or feeling exhausted, having angry or even emotional outbursts and feeling cynical or resentful can all be symptoms of burnout. <clears throat> and one thing I think is important to highlight is that the symptoms of burnout and depression can overlap quite a bit. So we think of burnout as a work-related phenomenon and depression, clinical depression, of course, as a mental illness. So they are two different entities, but because they are overlapping in terms of what they look like, I would urge you that if you are not feeling well when you are not at work, most people with burnout, when they're at home or when they're on vacation or the weekends, they feel great. They feel fine. It's when they go to work that they struggle. If you feel like you are experiencing these symptoms at all times, even when you're not at work, then I would urge you to speak to a physician or mental health professional to um, have an assessment for depression. Okay, so I want to talk for the remainder of this session together about reducing the risk of burnout in sharing five tips for preventing or limiting burnout if you are currently experiencing burnout. And the first tip is to practice mindfulness. So mindfulness is essentially a present moment focus. We are focusing on the here and now, whether it be our current experience, we can usually do this by tapping into the sensations in our body, noticing how our breath feels, noticing, you know, in our body, are we holding tension in our jaw, our shoulders, our forehead, and just letting that tension go. If we can focus on the present moment, that prevents us from ruminating on the past and from worrying about the future. If we're literally just thinking about what's right in front of us, we can't be distractedly thinking about other things. And the beauty of this is that it really allows us to tune into our body and mind and what we need. If we're just running around our day on autopilot, you know, flitting around and not really tuning into how we're feeling, then we don't notice when we get dehydrated or we're hungry or we're angry or you know, we're tired or whatever it might be, and then we don't attune to that. So what we know about physicians and nurses is that is that those who practice mindfulness have lower levels of burnout and engage in self-care more frequently. So mindfulness is really important. We also know based on other studies that it lowers stress, it improves mental health, and it also enhances focus. If you practice mindfulness, where you practice that when your mind wanders, you bring it back to the present moment, every time you bring your mind back to focus on your breath, or your body or whatever it might be, it's like a workout for your brain. And then during the day when you need to focus on other things, you have that built up brain capability of focusing. So how do we practice mindfulness? Well, you can do a body scan. There's lots of recordings that you can listen to on different apps and on YouTube that talk you through scanning your body from head to toe, focusing on each body part one at a time. There's mindful breathing exercises. Some people will do an exercise where they count their inhales and exhales. So counting to four on the inhale, counting to four on the exhale. A really great way to um, build up your parasympathetic 
response, so to reduce stress by engaging that rest and digest stage, is to really lengthen your exhale. So even inhaling to four and exhaling to six. Yoga is also a mindfulness practice because it really allows us to focus on our breath and our body. And then meditation is a great practice for mindfulness. For any of you who have not tried a meditation practice, I really urge you to consider downloading an app. Headspace is a great starting point. Insight Timer, Calm, there's tons of great apps out there. A great way to just check it out, see if it's for you and um, use that regularly if you find that you enjoy it. Another thing that I recommend is a mindful reset. So if during the day you feel like you're really, you know, feeling flustered and anxious and, and hurried, you can stop and just name five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can touch, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. And just tuning into your senses will help to just reset you and bring you back to the present moment. So tip number two is to plan self-care. So self-care is a long-term plan of using health-promoting behaviors to build up the reserves that will serve us during stressful times. This is not the same as coping strategies. This is not wine and Netflix after a long day. That is used in a time of crisis. It's fine in the short term. It's not going to help you in the long term. So self-care strategies could be exercising for 30 minutes every day, meditating for 10 minutes a day, every two weeks speaking to a mental health professional, listening to a podcast once a week, meeting with a financial planner, um, making time for social connection, committing to taking breaks at work, or tidying up clutter from your workspace. So some of these don't sound necessarily super fun, but they are mental and physically health promoting, and they are going to serve you in the long term. Tip number three for reducing burnout is to take time off. So many of us during the pandemic were like, I can't travel. I'm not going to take my vacation. I'm just going to skip it. Take your vacations. Even if you're not traveling, take time off. And if you have, you know, sabbaticals and other leaves that you can take advantage of, I urge you to take advantage of any and all time off. They give us parental leave and sabbatical leave for a reason. It's to let our mind engage in other things. And so often when we can get our mind off of work, when we come back to work, we are that much more engaged and energized to do the work that we want to do. Tip number four is to set boundaries. So when we are in a state where we are like right now, where work is just crazy and we're having a hard time keeping up, we wanna focus on what we can control. If you are feeling resentful or frustrated, chances are there is a need that you have that is not being met. Maybe it's a need for time off, a need for sleep, a need for alone time, or there's a limit being exceeded. You've worked too many days in a row, you've worked too long without a vacation. Know your limits when it comes to scheduling and caseload and stick to them. And I'm a big believer in personal rules. So honor personal rules for yourself. How much time do you need every day to sleep? How much time do you need to move? How much time do you need to spend with your family? What's your maximum amount you wanna spend on social media? Taking advantage of boundaries like turning off phone notifications and using email auto reply so that you don't feel like you have to check messages all the time is really important as well. Other ways that you can communicate boundaries. Um, here's some verbiage to help you. Work is extra tiring right now, so I'm limiting my volunteer activities to make sure I have time for my family. Or I need to have time in my day to finish my medical records, so please block off an hour in the morning and afternoon for catch up. Or I don't work more than five shifts in a row, so unless someone sw swaps a shift with me, I have to say no to picking up another one. Or I'm sorry things are so difficult for you right now. I'm also struggling to keep up, but when things settle down, I look forward to catching up and hearing more. Tip number five, the last tip for, um, for uh, preventing burnout and battling burnout is to say no more often. The more that you can say no, the less that's on your plate and the less burned out you'll feel. So people struggle with saying no. I also struggle with saying no, but here's some language to help you. So that doesn't work for me. Can we do this instead? I'm not available for that right now, but keep me in mind in the future. It's hard for me to turn that down, but I'm going to have to say no. No, but thank you so much for asking. I appreciate you asking, but I have to say no. I don't have what it takes to say yes, so I'm going to say no. That sounds great, but I'm going to have to say no. And I've got too much on my plate this summer, so my answer is no. 
Another way to communicate yes or no comfortably is to use the no but or yes if. So I'm gonna say no for this year, but I'd love to be considered again in the future. Or I'm not able to do this now, but after the summer I could take that on. Or yes, maybe the yes doesn't feel quite right, but you could modify it. So yes, if someone can take my Sunday shift, I'd be happy to work on Saturday. Or yes, if I can be paid overtime, I will stay late to perform that procedure. So those are my tips for you today. Remember, the big takeaway is if you don't first take care of yourself, you will not be able to continue caring for other people. So thank you so much for listening to our quick 12-minute session, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. I know there must be some questions out there. I couldn't possibly have covered everything when it comes to burnout. <laughs> wow, it looks like uh, it looks like you've covered everything, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's yeah. overwhelmed with everything they have to do now. <laughs> There's some uh, some great tips in there that I think we all need to take on board. Definitely, I can see some of them that I need to uh, I need to put into my daily practice in particular. Sounds good. So if there's no questions, then um, just a, a massive thank you, Marie. Thank you for, for going through there. As I said, some really interesting tips. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. I do see a question seems to have pinged up actually. Before we yeah, start. Olga's asked the question, can lack of appetite be burnout? And um, absolutely, Olga. So um, everybody experiences burnout in different ways. So there can be more subtle um, symptoms that can be attributed to that. Lack of appetite certainly for many is a sign of anxiety and when people are feeling burnt out and anxious about work then that can often elicit that way. For some people it's the opposite. They might start overeating. So changes in appetite again could be associated with depression as well um, or anxiety which could be independent of the burnout but could certainly be related to burnout too. The, the real key pieces are recognizing how do you feel when you're not at work? And if you generally feel well outside of work, then it probably is work-related um, and, and attributable to burnout. Great question. I think I saw another question in the Okay, so Ursula well. says, yeah, Ursula says, I work in an emergency practice that is extremely busy. We've added more staff and are actively looking for more, but it never seems like it's enough. How do you fit in breaks, not stay late and help others who need you? I found this extremely difficult and have to work an extra one to two hours per shift. And I don't feel like I can take a lunch break. Uh, Ursula, I feel you as an emergency and critical care specialist, I would say that the majority of my shifts go the same way. And I think there's two pieces to this. I think one of them is recognizing right now that we are the busiest we've ever been in this profession and we are the most lean on our resources. So unfortunately, um, you know, it's going to be rare that we are able to take a full lunch break or leave right at the end of our shift, unless we happen to run into a day where the caseload is manageable and the staffing is appropriate. So all I can tell you is that in situations like this, it's really important to be firm with your boundaries. If you recognize that, you know what, on the days that I work, I very often am, am staying late. Um, a boundary would be if I end up staying past my shift, I need to be compensated financially for that time. If you recognize that your 10 or 12 hour emergency shifts are turning into 12 or 14 hour shifts, then maybe you limit your shifts per week from four shifts to three shifts. Um, again, that's a boundary that you would need to set. Really important, and it sounds like they've done it, where they're really emphasizing that staffing is appropriate. The bottom line is, is without appropriate staff, you're not going to be able to take breaks. And so, again, making sure that staffing is appropriate so that at a particular time in your shift, you can say, okay, I'm not seeing any more cases from now on. I'm here to answer people's questions, but I'm going to be fo focusing on my medical records for the next you know, two, the last two hours of my shift so that I can be able to leave my shift on time. Um, and then again, as far as breaks go, making sure that there's enough coverage that you can take breaks. But 
it's been my experience in emergency practices nowadays that we are just so short on staff members and the caseload is just so high that a lot of that is difficult. But again, that's where for me, I've really had to set boundaries. This is the maximum amount of shifts I'll do. When I stay late, I have to be covered. And, and sometimes there just are not opportunities for me to stay late. If you have children that you have to get home to or whatever it might be, this is where communicating with your manager, with your supervisor to just say, look, like I've got a hard stop at this time. So we've got to adjust the schedule somehow so that I have coverage that I can step away, you know, a few hours before my shift to finish my medical records and to step away, you know, to take a break. And I've learned um, even though it might not be a half an hour break to really maximize, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes to just step outside, take a few deep breaths, get some nourishment, maybe do a quick connect with somebody on your phone and then, you know, back to work. But it's tough right now, Ursula, my heart goes out to you. Great question. Cool. I think there was one other question I saw in the chat box, which just said, which apps are recommended for meditation and also mindfulness? Oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. So um, as far as apps go, I, I mentioned a couple of them. So um, if you are just new to meditation, I really, really like um, the Headspace app. So it is a paid app, but they offer a 10 day free trial where they give you 10 minutes of a mindful meditation and kind of actually a little bit of a, a of a lecture, like a, a infomercial on mindfulness. So it's a great introduction that extends for 10 days. Um, otherwise, Calm is an app that people really like that can take you through body scans and mindfulness exercises or meditations, and especially meditations if you struggle with sleep. Calm has tons of sleep music and sleep meditations. Um, I tend to use the, the app Insight Timer. There, it's all you know free. There's thousands of meditations you can search by whatever content it is that you're looking for. Um, My Life is another app for people with families. There's family fr friendly meditations and, and mindfulness on there. So lots of great apps. I think there's a few other ones, but those are probably the top four that I would recommend. Great question. Great, thanks Marie. Awesome, thanks so much everybody. Perfect. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending and um, if you do want to see see the session again, the recording will be available on our website and also the YouTube channel shortly. Um, and also do keep an eye out for any of our future sessions. Next one being seven o'clock UK time next Wednesday, the 7th of July um, with Dr. Anna Nemec, um, which is offering a dentistry session. So please keep an eye out for that. And uh, we, all look, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Bye bye.